And ladies and gentlemen, I'm really excited to have this next guest on the show. Uh, he is someone that uh, not only do fans uh, really cheer for, but fighters and managers and a lot of people really look up to this man. Uh, we are talking about UFC welterweight contender, the man they call the James Krause. And uh, welcome to the show, James Krause, man. Glad to have you with us. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. So you are in Brazil right now, man. I want to thank you so much for staying up late with us. Oh, uh, no worries, man. I just, it was a weird deal. Like the, I did, I slept like minutes on the plane right here. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to commit to it and then just like be, be in a coma right now. And you guys call me and think I shook you or something like that. So I'm good. No, I'm, I'm wide awake. Let's, let's, uh, we can get this rolling. Absolutely. I really appreciate it, man. Thanks for looking out too. Not everyone appreciates the media. And so, you know, getting some respect is always a cool thing from UFC fighters. And thank you for that, man. Yeah, there's uh, there's some action going on uh, this Saturday in Sao Paulo, Brazil. You will be uh, going up against Sergio Moraes. Uh, have you fought in Brazil before? Or have you ever been here there before? No, no, that's by design. I, I, I no, I uh, <clears throat> typically when you go out of country, you, you're looking at like a 15 to 30 percent uh, increase on your tax there because you typically get double taxed. Uh, Brazil, however, just lifted that that tax. So uh, I've been offered probably like six or seven fights here. I just don't ever. Uh, I don't really. I don't really want to travel across the across the the. the to uh, take a pay cut. This doesn't sound like a good deal for me. Understandable, especially since you've been in the UFC uh, for a while and you keep winning. Uh, you have uh, a five-fight win streak going, and the one before that was just a split decision. So you haven't lost a fight uh, in five years. And, uh, you know, uh, we uh, understand that you definitely don't need to be trying to have uh, less uh, less uh, money and less benefits thrown at you. So, But you're there. I'm glad they lifted that because, you know, we definitely want fighters to be making as much as, uh, as they can. So so you got Sergio Marias. You're fighting a Brazilian in Brazil. Have you done that? I think you've been a road warrior in the past. And do you recall your experience uh, as far as fighting guys in their hometown, or is this going to be a first? Yeah, I mean, uh, my debut was against Sam Stout in uh, in Canada on short notice. So I mean, I'm no, I'm no, I'm no stranger to going to other people's hometowns and beating them up. So, uh, man, at the end of the at the end of the day, the way I look at it is like when we get when we get locked in that cage. Whether we're in Kansas City or Sao Paulo or or Antarctica, it doesn't really matter because when that cage door closes and they lock that door, those people can't help him. They can't help me. It's him and I in there, and we got we have 15 minutes or less to figure each other out. And uh, you know, the only the only factor that I feel like that plays into is uh, is maybe especially in Brazil, it's been a little shady. I don't know, maybe not shady, but questionable in the past. Uh, yeah. I just got to be honest with you. It's, it's my responsibility. I knew that taking this fight, it's my responsibility not uh, not let that be a factor. So I, I took this fight knowing that that could be an issue, and uh, I also took this fight knowing that I needed to finish. So that's that's all me, and that's not me. I'm very I'm very aware of what needs to be done to win this fight. I have to uh, brutally dominate or finish uh, to get that nod. Absolutely. Has Sergio Marias been someone that's been on your radar in the past? And uh, and if so, how long? Or did, did you just kind of take notice of him when this uh, fight was signed? Well, I've, I've, I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the sport, uh, you know, outside of competing myself. Uh, I've known Sergio since the Ultimate Fighter, so he's, I'm, you know, I'm no stranger to him. Uh, my teammate Zach Cummings has been offered to fight him twice, and uh, – Sergio got hurt once and Zach got hurt once. They never, <clears throat> they never fought each other. But Sergio is actually supposed to fight this last fight when I fought Warley Alves instead. Uh, something happened with visa issues, or so. I'm not, I'm not sure. So I was supposed to fight him. That was originally the fight I, I accepted, and uh, something happened within the visa issues. They gave me Warley. I beat Warley, and then uh, this fight just got thrown my way again. I like it. It's a new matchup. It's different for me. Quickly, I feel like the the crowd. And the UFC uh, would classify me as a striker. I think one of my best benefits is I have the ability to go anywhere, and uh, I'm I'm a I'm an MMA fighter. I'm good everywhere, and uh, but I will say they don't typically match me up with with great grapplers. So uh, it's a new, it's a new. Uh, I, I'm really excited about it. It's kind of got me on edge a little bit. It's a new puzzle piece for me to figure out. Uh, I feel like with uh, Another one of my great assets is the ability to figure things out on the fly with Fight IQ. So I'm really excited to just kind of have this new little uh, shiny object that I, you know, I have to try out and, and test out and, uh, you know, obviously make sure my game is on point to, to get the win on Saturday. 
I like what I'm hearing on that. I know that uh, your fight IQ is something that many people really do throw out there as being one of the best in the welterweight division. And may I ask, all the traveling you do to support your teammates and the fact that you're coaching people and you're really out there, I, I'm, I'm betting that that probably has helped you because you kind of, you, you learn while you teach. Isn't that true? Oh, absolutely, man. I mean, <clears throat> yeah, it's, I'm surrounded by, I watch fights. I, I can't tell. I watch every single card. I, I mean, and not just UFC. I watch all the Bellators. I watch one FC. I watch boxing. I watch the Bellator kickboxing. I watch the jiu-jitsu competition. So, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a diehard of the sport too. I'm not just a competitor. Right. I am a, a, a high level fan as well. So, um, yeah, man, I've been coaching for a long time. I've been coaching way before I should have been. And, uh, I just think experience. I have over 60 fights pro and amateur. I've been doing this. Uh, I call it since the wild west days to where there was really no, like it wasn't really super organized. Like whenever I started doing it, a lot of times you would just weigh in and they'd be like, this guy's 165, this guy's 177. That, that works. Like I've done that before. I've been a part of that era. And, uh, I just have, experience in, in in coaching and in competing and i've seen so many different fights that like you know what what the hell just happened or i've seen so many different scenarios play out I mean, you guys know how crazy the sport is and i've seen all those different things play out so i feel like the experience that i have not just with competing but with coaching definitely helps uh at iq I, and i also think i'm able to like clearly see these things as they're happening you know uh I, I'm hard to shake in there. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm hard to, I'm hard to get uh, flustered in there. So, uh, I think that's one of my best assets is, is, is to see those things on the fly and see them fast, you know, not, not yeah. adjustments, but see the things happen as they unfold. Yeah, absolutely. And that's really important. Having that vision. It's almost like a baseball player that has like extra good eyesight. They can kind of slow the ball down when it's coming at them, even though it's a hundred miles an hour and make those adjustments. And so, yeah, I was talking to a, a previous guest, uh, I think uh, a week or two ago about being able to make adjustments in there. And that I think a lot of people don't know is one of the hardest things because when you're under fire and all the bullets are flying proverbially with all the fists and all the kicks and all the, 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 yep. the grappling to be able to make those adjustments uh, in there is really, really important. And I think only the better fighters do that. And, you know, being a cerebral fighter and being a student of the game is really important all the way back to Mike Tyson. And this is going back before a lot of our uh, viewers time. But I remember that uh, when I was real young, I was a big boxing fan that, uh, that he was, was known as being student in the game he was watching like yeah. boxing footage from like 1920 and 1930 and <clears throat> yeah you, know, you would consider him a historian he was super yes. knowledgeable of, of the custom auto made him watch it yes right yep and he would be like what i think he was uh his biggest uh idol was jack dempsey from the 19 teens and the 1920s yeah, he, he was a huge fan of the sport as well not just a competitor yeah it, Part of it, right? You almost have to be semi-obsessed with the game, right? I mean, yeah. To some people can pull off, like Cowboy's a guy that doesn't watch fights and stuff like that. But for the most part, I feel like you have to be obsessed with it to some uh, to some degree to see some success. Absolutely. So, now your teammate Zach Cummings moved to 185. We've had him on the show a couple times. He's a great guy. I think 85 is a good fit for him. But you stay at 70. I don't recall if you've ever been anywhere other than that. Usually, maybe in early fights out of the UFC, people fought somewhere else. But remind us, have you been at 170 in every organization? Uh, or have you been at various weights? No, I just moved to 170. Uh, my last fight was my first fight at 170. Uh, well, I've had two fights at 170 in the UFC. To, uh, pretty much my whole career, I spent at 155. So oh wow! I just, I just came up. I just came up, and uh, 55 was a really difficult cut for me to make. And uh, but yeah, I, I just came up uh, for the for permanently. I just came up recently. Very cool. It's almost like you and Zach moved at a similar time. You to uh, to welterweight and him to middleweight. Exact same time, actually. I like that. Was yeah, that we what, moved at the exact same time. And that was probably by design, as as the two of you wanted to not. Uh, be no, in the same not really. Time, no? Not really. He, he he had just recently fought. Um, I can't remember who he. I can't remember who he fought. Uh, but he did at seventy, man. He just it's too it's too much of a cup. Yeah. <laughs> It's not just like uh, for me, it's more of a quality of life thing. For him, it's more of like physically, he just is dog shit at seventy, man. Like his cuts, like he's almost killing himself. Yeah. And I'm not even exaggerating. Like, yeah, quite yeah. literally, he's almost killing himself to make seventy. And it just seems like it's like half the time he doesn't make it in the fight because he, he either gets hurt. Yeah. Or he 
fight or something happens, it's like, man, like, what's the point of all this if you can't even make it to the fight? So, like, size yeah. doesn't matter if you don't ever fight, you know? Yep. And absolutely. for me, it's just a quality of life thing. Like, I, I just hate my life. Like, if I fight three times a year, it takes me two months to get to 155, you know? And I yeah. hate everybody. I hate everybody. I hate everything. And, yeah. uh, like, that's just no way to live. Yeah. It's not it's... 70, 70, I can just work, man. I agree. Yeah, I, I just put my head down and work at 170. Absolutely. I think that's a better thing that we're seeing more of than we used to. I think like five years ago, everyone was killing themselves to make as, as light a weight as they can. And more people were yep. missing weight, right? And I, it seems to be the trend is changing and more people are realizing it's not a good thing. I mean, can I ask, in your opinion, is that because of fighters and coaches realizing it on their own? Or is the fact that some of these commissions are saying if you weigh higher than a certain weight, uh on fight day we're gonna we're, we're gonna not let you fight and then we're gonna insist you go up in division is some of it just kind of from that by force no. or do you think a lot of fighters are kind of no i don't think so at all okay i think it i think it's all choice man the guys are tired of feeling like shit all week you know what i mean like i'm eating i'm eating good dinner i mean you can check my instagram story uh i'm eating good dinners i had a big plate a sushi tonight like it's not just it's not just the week it's not just the cut it's the it's the quality of life leading up to it. Yeah. And like one of the decisions that, that really there's, there's multiple de examples that made, made us sway the decision, but we're talking like three weeks out from a fight. I don't even want to train, you know, yeah. I just want to, yeah. I just want to go home. I don't want to be there. Yeah. And, uh, at 55, I'll catch myself in fights, like looking up at the clock because I'm getting tired. I'm trying to pace the fight. Yeah. And at 70, man, these guys are bigger, but they're slower. They're stronger, but I can work, man. I can just, I can work. I don't get tired at 70. I can just keep working for 15 minutes or less. And uh, like when I fought Worley, I was not tired a little bit. Uh, I can just work, man. I, yeah. And that's that's what I like about it. I know I'm giving. I'm not a small 70. I don't think. No. I, mean, no. I was 195 and a half a, a couple weeks ago. Right. Absolutely. That's what I was thinking as well. And by the way, congratulations on that win against Worley. Worley's been killing it just like you have. And, uh, yeah. you know, that was that was your second fight at 70 or your first? Uh, so I fought uh, I fought Tom uh, Galicchio at 170 uh, after the after the show. And then I went back to 55 and then I went back one time. And I fought like shit. I looked terrible. And then I was like, screw it. I'm just going to go back up to 170. So I went back up to 170 and fought Worley and. I felt great in that fight. Yeah, that, and that's fantastic. And that was a fight that definitely anyone could have won because both of you have been on a good streak. And so that was impressive. And so, yeah, I think 70 is the right place for you. So you're doing a lot of coaching. You're doing a lot of traveling. And you're a fighter with a winning record. You're a ranked fighter. And you're still out there definitely helping and coaching. Were you saying that it's something you're not sure you should be doing? Or do you think are you are you kind of having to back off of that as far as how much coaching, coaching and help you're, you're giving? Or, or, or is that something? And you can continue no, no I, I i continue to stay coached i mean i i come out uh, to denver with my with my my coach a couple of times but i mean i have good people that back back at my gym but uh no i mean i stay i i want to be a coach i'm a, I'm, a, I'm a i'm a coach after this so i'm a coach now but i mean you know, I, I plan on going full-time into coaching as soon as i'm done fighting whenever that may be uh I, no, I stay. I stay on the road. I'm on the road almost every weekend, and uh, I, I. The thing is, is like I feel like people are just now starting to ask me that, and it's like, <clears throat> for me, people are. I, I think what you're asking is like, do you feel like that's a hindrance, like being on the road every weekend? Right. Man, I've been doing that shit for like four or five years now. It's just now I'm starting to get some more accolades of from coaching. Like people right. are starting to notice that I'm a decent coach. Yes. So now people are just starting to ask me. But I've been doing this for a long time. You know what I mean? Like I've been coaching on every weekend. For a long time now, so it's nothing new to me. You know what I mean? It's just I've been doing this pretty much since I've been in the UFC. You know, Very cool. people just are just now starting to notice because I'm starting to coach other people in the UFC. Right, that makes sense. You've been doing it for a while. It's good to hear. You were over in yeah. Boston uh, a few weeks ago. I was there covering it from a Power Hour. Funny thing I saw was remember when they asked your your guy uh, Sean Woodson. <laughs> yeah. what shamrock fc <laughs> did for about. him <laughs> yeah. so what it does for people watching is a great reporter who will remain nameless and, and you know known for very good questions this time i think maybe he wasn't phrased perfectly but he asked uh one of uh one of uh, james teammates john woodson what uh shamrock fc an organization the guy had fought him before had done uh to help him uh you know and he said shamrock fc hadn't done shit for me and i think james nah, was they saying, have it, man. <laughs> i hate 
I don't want to like, I don't want to talk down to anybody. You yeah. know what I mean? Like I'm not trying to out anybody, Yeah. but those dudes aren't trying to help anybody. You know what I mean? Like they're a business, bro. Like I, I, I I'm in Kansas city. I, they're based out of uh, Kansas city and St. Louis. Yeah. I deal with those guys all the time. They are not out to help anybody except themselves. Right. And, and for anybody that says otherwise, and look, man, I'm good with that. Yeah. But let's call a spade a spade. You know yes. what I mean? Don't act like these guys are out here. Right. Help. I love, I love, uh, I love James. James is the one that asked that. I love him. Yes. And, uh, he does a lot of stuff with them. They throw him a lot of bones. You know what I mean? So I get it. I get what he was trying to do. And, uh, I, I don't mean anything bad about it, but I just want to, let's call it a one-on-one and a two-on-two. Two, you know what I mean? Like yes. you're not trying to help anybody. You're trying to, you're trying to have a business and that's okay. Yep. Exactly. You know, let's not kid here. No. You guys are a business and you're trying to make money, which is fine. Yeah. Well, let's just call it that. Absolutely. I agree. I agree. And uh, maybe what he went and meant more to say was were they instrumental in but then again with the fact that like you said they're throwing him <laughs> bones, there was probably there was probably that him wanting to throw them out there anyway. But yeah, the perfect response and you fell from the sitting position to on your side there. <laughs> it's really <laughs> funny to see there. I did, I did. Yeah. I fell over. That was hilarious. I fell over, man. But man, your guy Woodson, man, that's a tough kid. And it's funny too. He's such kind of an easygoing guy and he's got almost like yeah. a little bit like a dad bod. And I remember, <laughs> I remember some of the other uh, media people were saying this guy looks like just someone's little brother, or he's just happy to be here. He probably doesn't care if he wins yeah. or loses, and he's probably about to get smashed oh, by Bokniak. No. And man, that That's guy's a case. yeah, this guy's a beast, Woodson, isn't he? Yeah, he's he's an animal, man. He's long, good takedown defense. He's got great boxing. Uh, his volume is insane. His range is ridiculous. Like, yeah, he's, he's incredible. That kid's going to be really tough to beat. Absolutely. And so you're based in Kansas city and I know Invicta's over there. You do. You, I know that, uh, you have Megan who fought there a lot. And, uh, do you still check out Invicta or was that only when Megan was with them? No, no, they're based out of KC. I support Invicta hundred percent. Uh, their shows are always fantastic. I don't have a lot of girls at my gym. I have a couple different amateurs outside of Megan, but I don't really have a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, my own of uh, my own fighters on that show just because i don't have that many girls uh, i have a couple girls going pro soon i'm sure they'll fight for invicta at some point uh, i just don't i i support them 100 percent. i love invicta i would do anything for them i I'm them and and uh, i just some, like post fight interview stuff for them for shannon is an incredible job she's done such a uh, a good job building that organization up to what it is today but uh, I 100% support Invicta. Love what they're doing. Love everything about what they're doing. And I'm uh, very, very happy that they're in Kansas City. Yeah, absolutely. I wish they were closer. Here, uh, I'm in California. We went on Saw them live uh, and covered it when they were in Lemoore, California, a couple of years ago. But I've been, yeah. I've been big with uh, with women MMA guests. That's one of the things is that I, I think I may have more uh, women uh, UFC fighters and and Invicta fighters on my show than most other shows. And uh, so no, I, I appreciate that organization and. Shannon and is doing a great job and uh you know we had caitlin young on uh when she was a matchmaker and we talked to julie kedzie and you know just uh just great people there speaking of uh, your teammates anyone other than you have a fight coming up you'd like to shout out uh yeah grant uh grant dawson is fighting uh january 18th on the on the the i believe it's vegas they've just, i don't know if they've decided that yet or not but i believe it's going to be vegas uh zach cummings is on that card as well. I don't think that's been announced yet, but he's uh, he's on that card as well. So I have we have a whole squad on that uh, on that January card. Excellent. And what's your team? What's the the name of your gym? Glory. Glory. Yep. Glory. It's, and it's not Glory Kickboxing. Glory MMA, of course, right? Yep. Fantastic. So James, tell us a little bit about your background, man. How did you get into MMA? I'm sure enough people know about it, but did you start in, in, in kind of all the combat sports together? Like a lot of these young guys are doing, you're still a young guy enough, uh, you know, compared to me, but you know, a lot of these guys now are going to gyms and, and are, are, are learning the wrestling at the same time as Jiu Jitsu and the same time as the, the striking. But most of the guys who are like 25, 28, 30 years old did not do that. How did, how did you come into, into, into combat sports what made you jump into uh combat sports what was your background and and, and what uh what elements of uh combat did you start studying first i didn't really have a background uh i wrestled a little bit in high school for like two years i don't think i ever finished the season i sucked i wasn't good uh but i started in mma uh you know just doing kind of everything you know everything all together and uh i just got into it it's something that i had a friend kind of talked me into coming and checking out a gym and man i just showed up and i fell in love with it i never really left and uh 
I, I, just, I really love everything about the sport. Um, and, and I always, I always appreciated like the ultimate challenge on it's made me the sport of MMA has made me such a better human being and, and a man, like the sport will make you a man. You yeah. know what I mean? Like there, there really isn't a whole lot of time. Uh, there really isn't a, 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 a big place for immaturity in the sport. You know what I mean? Like, so like this sport is full of heartbreak. It's, it, it's got so many life less highs and the lowest lows. And that's cliche to say, but it is so true. So I feel like this sport has kind of made me a man and molded me into the person I am today. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I just fell in love with it. You know, I fell in love with everything about it, the life lessons that come with it, the hard work, uh, the sacrifice, the reward, everything that comes with the sport of MMA. Uh, and as just as a fan, you know, mm -hmm. I really fell in love with it uh, as a practitioner of jiu-jitsu and kickboxing and wrestling. And there's, I just love everything about the sport. You, that's awesome. And that's uh, it, it kind of makes for a better life. They say if you like what you're doing or you love what you're doing, then it's not yeah. like you're not going to work every day you're doing yep. something enjoy do you remember the first year or the first uh ufc that you watched uh y ufc one yeah wow i, I watched I, yeah i rented it i rented it uh i think i would have been seven years old i rented it at the movie store wow had no idea what, had no idea what it was movie store. and 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 so yeah so you were seven well about 20 what 23 years ago 22 years ago so uh, the UFC started in '93, is that right? Yeah, it did. But I'm, I know you weren't. I, I was born. I was born in '80 '86. So that yep, that's seven. Oh wow, that's I nine, didn't. I didn't know old. that. I didn't know that you were saying you actually rented it and when it came out, man, that's crazy. Because you know I'm older. Yeah. I'm older than you, and I actually did order that pay per view. Uh, a friend of mine was training with the Gracies from the late '80s in their garage. I had a copy of the press kit for UFC. Oh 1, wow. Yeah, three months before the event. And I didn't know anything about it. I you know I seen it at this movie store. I was like, oh, this looks really cool. I love like uh, one of my favorite movies growing up was Lionheart with uh, John Claude Van Damme. Yes. So I was, I was like, oh man, this looks kind of close. Let me watch this. And then I just fell in love with it. And they would just keep, you know, UFC 1, UFC 2, 3, 4 days. I would rent them every time. Did you have any idea, though, watching then? And for those that don't know, the sport was very different than it is now when it was NHB, no holds, no holds yeah. barred fighting. It was only heavyweights. Uh, and it was no gloves, headbutts. There was, you know, it was real true valet Tudo rules. And, and, and I can imagine probably at seven, eight, or nine years old, it would have been very unusual for anyone to know they wanted to do it. But did you have any inkling that, that this or something like you were seeing would be, would be what you'd be doing uh, as an adult? Not a clue, no. Uh, honestly, I, even, even when I was doing it and when I was saying it, like, I know a lot of people that, man, I'm just from a, from a different area. And, and, and to be honest with you, when it comes to like Kansas City MMA, mm -hmm. there's guys that were in the UFC before me. Don't get me wrong. Like uh, Curtis Stout was the first one. Rob Kimmons was the first one to win in the UFC. Uh, but like there really wasn't a blueprint on how to get there. And I kind of I feel like I kind of set that in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. So like I would say it a lot like, hey, I'm going to be in the UFC one day. But I didn't know how I didn't I didn't even know anybody in the UFC, honestly. And uh, what really like hit, made it hit home uh, close to home was when uh, Tim Elliott joined my gym, and uh, we were training together. My main training partner as as a 125er, and I was his as a 155er. Right. And uh, he got signed to the UFC because you know he was great. The division was super light. He got signed on short notice by John Dotson. And man, I said, bro, this is this is real. Like I now know somebody that's like this is it's within our reach. One of my best friends is in the UFC, so that's when it became real. Like that's when I, that's when I knew that I could somehow get there a, some other way than the Ultimate Fighter, because that was kind of my only. The Ultimate Fighter was like my only way to get there. It just seemed like the only way to get signed. You know what I mean? Like it was hard. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, yeah. When he when he, when he got signed, it really hit home, and uh, I, I really pushed hard from there, and uh, I got a lot better, made a lot of strides. Um, and then obviously with the expansion of like HDNet and Access TV, uh, that helped me out a lot because I fought a lot for RFA and Titan, and that that hit me up a little bit. And then WEC, I was an Ultimate Fighter, and then uh, Bellator once, and then you know I just I kind of put myself out there. I did a bunch of bunch of different things.
Absolutely. What do you think about the Ultimate Fighter? Was that a good experience uh, for you? And would you do it again, or were you one that didn't like it? I would say that I would. I would have. I would do it again. I would not do it over again. Does I that make sense? Yeah. Like if if I had to rewind, I would do it again. It's a great experience. Uh, man, that show will make a man of you. That's for damn sure. Uh, but I would not do it over again. It's yeah. it's hard. It's one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. Yeah, it makes sense. What do you think? Yesterday was the anniversary uh, of the first UFC, 26 years ago. Yesterday, do you think the the way the, know yeah the way do you think the way the sport was back then, no holds barred in in any semblance of it? Because I know that that they had one rule set: no biting, no eye gouging in the first fight, and then a few fights later, they took out the groin shots, they took out the head butts, they took out yeah. twelve to six elbows, they took out the soccer kicks. But do you think that that there's there was any way that it could have continued with just the original rule set, or were some of these more violent techniques were in there, or do you think it that just wouldn't have caught on and people wouldn't have liked it, or, or you know, I'm I'm just curious to ask a an active fighter now, could that no, have it's gone too on? rough. Yeah, it was too rough. It, it's not it's not main it's not made. It needs like and they talk about this. Uh, and like they just did Chuck and Tito's Thirty for Thirty. They talk about this a lot. They talk. They they did like the anniversary show. Uh, they pushed towards the the uh, uh, to get it regulated, the regulation of it, and yeah. uh, that's really what it took. I think you know to get rid of like the barbaric, make it a sport, not a fight. If that makes yeah. sense. And yeah. I know we're we're dealing with fighting, but uh, I think some of the stuff is just too. They would never would have gotten to the point that it is now on like mainstream TV. They, ESPN or Fox or any of that. There's no way in hell that they would have put that stuff on there. So, yeah. uh, I think what they did is is the best move that they could have done. Got it regulated, and uh, it kind of toned it down a little bit uh, to the point where they can at least start putting it on TV and people want to watch it from a mainstream. Yeah, games. absolutely. I remember uh, they used to have a viewer advisory on the remember that the the black and yeah. white yup and yeah. uh, i remember bruce beck said this is not an exhibition this is real brutal combat if you yeah. don't you're not having a strong stomach you might not want to watch and yeah it was it was definitely crazy stuff you know one thing that i never knew uh for quite a while is that if you remember the first uh the first fight that john mccarthy the first card that big john reft was ufc2 and he kept on yelling to the different corners, watch your fighter, watch your fighter. The reason why is that Horian Gracie, who was, a, who was you know, a friend of his, uh, had said, you are not allowed to stop the fight for any reason. And so he really was like, he, and, and he didn't like that experience because he saw some things not go that well. And he had to keep on yeah. yelling to the corner, watch your fighter, watch your fighter. And the corner was like, I'm watching him. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to throw the towel in. I'm watching him, you yeah. know. And, and so after that fight is when John McCarthy kind of negotiated and said, I can't do that again. It, it, it can't be that I can't be yeah. here to protect the fighters. I have to be here to protect the fighters. And that's something that is important. As a referee, they have such a hard job. Do you feel that most of the referees are doing a really good job and it's just a harder job than a lot of fans think? Or, or what's your thought on, on you know, being a, a, a big-time MMA referee and how most of them are doing and, and you know, what, the, what, what about the heat that a lot of them are taking? Yeah, I mean, it is a difficult job, no doubt, because you got to make – we're talking about like we're not talking about stuff where like in NFL they have the booth upstairs that reviews every play and it's not it's not like that. There's one guy, you know, one guy making the decisions. And uh whenever I think of a good referee, the guy that pops into mind is Herzog. Jason Herzog's my favorite referee. Cool. Uh and I think the characteristics that he has that I really like is is uh he's not part of the show. You know what I mean? Very rarely do you do you hear you know, he stays out of the way. He's not the show. He's the referee, and he's right. there to referee. And I feel like some of the other guys uh, want to be part of the show. Yeah. You know, and uh, I don't, I don't, I don't like that because it. The, that's not what you're there for. You're not part of the show. You're 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 there to do a job. And uh, so the best referees, in my opinion, are ones you really don't hear from a lot. You don't see a lot of them because yeah. they stay out of the way and they let fighters fight. You know, if there's rules broken, they step in when they need to. But for the most part, they stay out of their way. And they let people fight because that's what you know. Really, that's what. Just like you're not you're not part of the show. You're not part of the 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 feature presentation. So, and I feel like some of the guys are are 
uh, I feel like some of the guys try to be a part of that rather than stay back and do their job. Understood. Very good observation. What do you think also about uh, the, the fights being stopped? Obviously, the biggest thing on most people's minds is the BMF belt, uh, Nate Diaz against uh, Jorge Masvidal. I think a lot of people didn't see during that fight that not only did uh, Nate have a big cut on the top of his eye, I'm pointing there, and then below his eye as well, so above and below, yeah. which is definitely not good when you start getting a uh, you know, something digging in in both areas because possibly your eye could fall out. But what did you yeah. think? Can I get your opinion on that? Because so many fans were so upset because Nate was saying, I'm ready. And then afterward, Nate said, my plan was in the fourth and fifth rounds, I was going to start coming on stronger and taking over. You know, who knows whether that's, that's you know, would have happened or not. But was that an okay stoppage? Did the doctor do the right thing or there? Or, or in that situation, would you as a fighter – Rather, that's, if it was you, you know, let it go. That's hard for me to say because I didn't see the inside of the cut. Um, I will say this. It did not seem to be impairing his vision at all. And uh, I I'm, I don't think it was a good stoppage. I've seen way worse cuts go on. Yeah. Uh, I, but I, I, I didn't see it. They really didn't zoom in on it that much. It didn't seem like it was that bad. I mean, really, the cut, unless it's just crazy deep, it's the cut is nothing, right? It's more about vision impairment yeah. than anything. His vision was fine. The blood was seemed like maybe a little bit, but not to the point of where it was like a huge problem. Uh, so that seemed like it was a little bit of a iffy stoppage. I can't say that though because I didn't see the cut. Right. Um, I will, however, say I don't think it would have made a difference. I mean, I think there was. I mean, it was I, the from on what was happening, and I don't think I don't think the fourth or fifth round would have been any different. Yeah, you're probably right. It's funny because someone had said that the doctor wasn't supposed to be able to just stop it, but I, I think the doctor does have the ability to just stop it. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, it uh, wasn't the referee in that case at all. But, yeah, as far as referees, they do have a hard job, and it seems like you're always too soon or too late as far as a referee in most people's opinion. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't – unless it's terrible, it's hard to argue those. You know what I mean? It, I would rather be on the end of just a shade late than early. You know what I mean? Because you see a lot of guys that fight back and win. Yeah. And also with that, you're concerned with fighter safety. I mean, for the most part, I think they do a good job. Yeah, makes sense. Let me get your opinion on a few upcoming fights since I know you're a student of the game, uh, if that's all right with you. Sure. Appreciate that. So in your division, you have the title fight, uh, Covington and Usman. And that's a really interesting one. Both are really, really good wrestlers, uh, and and both obviously don't like each other, and, and they're both really winning fighters, both in their prime. Uh, how do you see that fight playing out? I, I, I mean, so many people think it's going to be a dull fight where neither of them are going to try a takedown, and they're both going to be you know, doing some not great striking the whole time. I don't know. I kind of think that it will be exciting, but do you, can, can you share any insight as a, as a high-level UFC fighter from what you've seen about these two men? Anything that maybe we should look out for as, uh, as fans or as journalists that might people might not be thinking about in that matchup? There's a part of me that wants to tell you that I don't think Usman's going to lose a round. Uh, and then there's another part of me that, man, Covington is pushing such a, a relentless pace. Uh, all that being said, I'm going to go uh, I'm gonna go Usman. I think Usman's going to win. I think he's going to be pretty dominant, too. Uh, I do think he's going to be able to stop the takedown. I think Colby's going to be shooting. I don't think Usman will be, though. Uh, yeah. I, just, I think Usman's a far superior wrestler. The only thing that Colby has going for him is that pace. Yeah. I think his pace is insane. Yeah. So I don't see him winning the first two, three. I mean, I just don't think he's – I think he's been too much, man. Yeah, and, absolutely. So, and speaking about rounds, uh, the main event uh, with uh, Zabit Megamed Sharapov and Calvin Cater – went three rounds uh do you have any yeah. opinion, do you have any opinions on that i actually put a post up on social media asking what people thought about that to me if a main event's supposed to be five rounds then that means a main event's supposed to be five rounds and i'd say probably 80 sure. percent of the people replied to my poll agreeing <laughs> with me but there were about 20 percent of people that said well no in this situation they had uh they had been scheduled to be the co-main and the main co -main, fell out yep. right and the contract they sign 
only agreed to three rounds, and apparently the UFC had spoken with both of them, and Cater said five was fine, but Megamed Sharapov had had staph infections, and he said, no, I'm barely going to be able to do this at three. Do you think in a situation like that it, it makes sense, or do you think when someone's bumped to being the main event, the UFC should be able to say, dude, you're fighting five rounds, and that's it? Yeah, you got to pay him for it, though. You know what I mean? Like, you're fighting almost double time. It's like almost two fights in one night. So as long as you're getting paid for it, I'm down with it. That makes sense. So they would need to increase the pay. That's a good idea. And if they did that, yeah, absolutely. and if it were you, would you want to be given the choice? Or as long as they increased your pay, would you be okay if they could insist you fight five? Because that's what I think some people are wondering about. The longer the fight goes, my value, the longer the fight goes for me, my value goes up. So I've, I'm for sure going to pick five over three as long as you compensate me for it. I like that. Makes sense. Uh, next fighter pick. want to ask your opinion on, on that UFC 245 uh, card. Max Holloway against uh alex volkanovsky there's about a five inch height difference in uh in that matchup and i think that's a really interesting one because max holloway is just a beast and volkanovsky has really yeah. been killing it what do you what do you what do you think in that matchup how does that go down i'm gonna go uh max but i think it's gonna be a really competitive fight man i really do I think this is good at closing that gap pressuring uh i just think I think Max is going to be able to keep range, keep volume. I, th I think it'll be a very competitive fight. I don't think it's going to be a shutout, uh, but I do think Max is going to get the win. Yeah, you could be right. I think it's going to be a great matchup, too. Volkanovski impresses me a lot. And then the final matchup, the ladies. Am I the only one that feels that uh, Jermaine Durandamy has a chance in that? I'm starting to feel that I'm the only one that feels that way, but what are your thoughts? No, not at all. I just had this conversation today. I said – I think Nunez is still going to win. Don't get me wrong. Right. But I think that fight is – is I think Durand is going to make that very, very interesting. I don't think it's going to be a shutout at all. I think it's a very competitive fight. The last time I checked, they had Durand me at like plus 260 odds. Yeah. I think that's way undervalued, way undervalued. And uh, I think it's going to be very competitive. I still do have Nunez winning, but I think Durand is going to – bring some heat yeah i agree i agree i think if nunez wants to to give durandamy space to strike and durandamy being an eight-time muay thai champion then that's going to be something that uh Dur durandamy is absolutely going to take advantage of she's a little bit of a longer fighter and uh yep. you know definitely her muay thai is better but yeah amanda's tough being the double champ it's ironic because if durandamy takes that title Amanda is still the 145 champ. So, you know, I guess that's kind of one of the best uh, consolation prizes that if you get beaten in a fight and you're the champ, you get to go home with a belt still. So it makes it yeah. not that bad, right? Although I'm sure she wants yeah. both, right? Well, man, I'm excited to see your fight coming up Saturday. And uh, it is against Sergio Marias. What are you, uh, number five or four fight or number six? Do you know what order they're going to be in? Seven, I think. Number seven, cool. It's going to be I'm thinking, awesome. I'm thinking I'm seven. That's going to be awesome, man. Well, I really look forward to another great performance from the James Krause representing Glory MMA. You guys are killing it. And uh, I want to thank you so much for, for spending your time here at night in Brazil, joining us in the MMA Power Hour. Let people know real quick uh, how they can support you on social media. Uh, it's pretty much the James Krause on, on all of them, Facebook, Instagram. I'm on active on Instagram most, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And fantastic. Anything else you want to say? Anyone, anything you want to throw out there in the last couple seconds? No, I appreciate you for having me on. My pleasure, James. Go do what you do, man. We'll be cheering for you. Thanks.